subjects. Today, we're looking specifically at exposure therapy in relation to emetophobia and why actually it's not helpful, why we would never recommend it, and why we do things a little bit differently over here. Um, if that sounds like it's something that you could spiel about for this podcast, Rob, not, back and forth. Whenever you tell me about these, you always make it sound like such a small thing. You know, oh, it's, a, it's a two or three minute conversation, but that's like a massive subject, which is good, okay? Because it yeah. must be confusing for metaphobes out there. So it's, 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 a, mm. it's a big, but good subject. Okay, so I just start. Good. Yeah, well, it, it, essentially, I mean, the, the overarching topic of our chat about exposure therapy today is why it's not helpful or, you know, our take on why it's not helpful. Um, so yeah, please, you know, what, what's your thoughts? Ooh, okay, okay. So in essence, then, there are, there are probably two main reasons why we don't recommend it the first reason is it doesn't work and the second reason is if you understood or when when a person understands in depth about emetophobia you'd understand why it's actually really unhelpful to even attempt exposure therapy okay so let's take a step back from that look at the bigger picture we always try to do there are about 10, 12 million emetophobes in the English-speaking world, okay? And you and I know that our mission statement in Emetophobia 3 and the Thrive Program is to get help to as many of those people as possible, okay? Right. Our yep. mission is to get help to as many of those people as possible. We're not sitting back, getting on with our lives, offering assistance to one or two people that come to see us, we are actively going out and offering assistance in as any way possible to those 10 million people because we have a cure for the thing that is ruining their life that nobody else has. So that's the first thing. Yep. And what I mean by that is, as you know, we are not interested in helping one or two people. We are not interested in helping 20% of the people that come to see us. You know it agonizes sorry i agonize over the fact that you know when we hear from someone who's not doing well or we hear from someone who's not getting it or we hear from someone who needs a bit of extra help it really bothers us that that one person in 10 or that one person in 20 is struggling with it so that's yep. the first thing okay it's it would be easy to cherry pick one emetophobe in a hundred that might have a rather successful outcome from going to exposure therapy. Okay. Mm -hmm. One in a hundred yep. might have um, some kind of successful outcome from going through exposure therapy. Okay. And we have to clarify what that means as well. Okay. But that means those 99 other people that have attempted it have failed another treatment, have exposed themselves to vomit, which has probably made them worse has massively increased their desire for control and their panic because they've now partly faced their fear and not got over it. So yep. imagine if yep. you've got imagine if you've got a fear of being mugged, okay? And you go out intentionally to get yourself mugged and you get mugged, but it doesn't get you over your fear of mugging. How do you think you're going to feel? Yeah, a great deal more powerless and wanting to not be mugged even more. It, it's just massively reiterated and confirmed your belief why this thing is terrible and why you And then you're annoyed with yourself for having done it. You're annoyed with the person that recommended you try and do it. You're annoyed with the therapist that attempted to get you through it. So, so that's that's kind of one of the reasons. I mean, in the literature uh, uh, and the research, it's a very poor success rate for exposure therapy. It's a very, very poor success rate. And I have got some of the research up here in front of me, okay? The biggest study ever undertaken um, had only seven participants, okay, into exposure. And these were hand-picked people that went through with a therapist over many, many sessions, over a long period of time, fully supported. And the only results were 
that they seemed that their emetophobia symptoms seemed to get a little worse. Sorry, seemed a right. mistake. Seemed to get a little bit better. Now it's yep. such a poor research paper that it doesn't say what they did or how they did it or whatever other outcomes there were, um, or whether they came back longitudinally a year later to see whether it was still the same. You know, we know from other research that, and why we push it so hard that we get people to the point where they're cured. You know that I say to people, when people say, that, oh, I'm 90% better, Rob. I say, that's great, but you need to be 100. Yep. Why do you need to be 100, right? Because if you haven't resolved all the conflicts that are causing your phobia, and you're keeping a little bit alive, there's a good chance it's going to come back. Or there's a yep. good chance that you're going to recreate it the moment you get stressed about something again. You don't want that. You don't want to be quietly confident you're not going to get mugged. You mm -hmm. either want to know that you're not going to get mugged, Joe, or yep. you want to be a black belt in karate. One of the two. Um, and can I just clarify on that point, or um, just to make sure that I'm fully understanding what you're saying and everyone else that is, is that being 100% over your phobia doesn't mean loving and laughing when you are sick. It means knowing with complete confidence that you absolutely can be sick and cope with the emotions that you create around being sick. There's a big yeah. difference between the two. Yeah, you, 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 can, you can tolerate the difficult. I, I, just, I just had COVID for a week again, okay? And uh, though it was unpleasant, um, I knew that I would tolerate it and I knew yeah. that sooner or later it would go and I'd be over it and I knew that sooner or later I'd be back on my feet again and things would be all right. So therefore it wasn't a big thing. It was annoying. Um, it came at the wrong time. Uh, I, unlike you, I didn't miss uh, New Year's Eve. I, I, I was still able to do something New Year's Eve by myself. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, being over it means having the skill set in life to tolerate all sorts of difficult situations and and um and move on from it confident and happy within you know within moments but the yeah, point exactly. is that's why i just want to clarify that because a lot of emetophobes potentially could be listening in and thinking that they want to get to the point where they love and enjoy being sick and yet that expectation is a little bit unrealistic we are saying that to be 100 percent over your phobia it is about knowing that you absolutely can and will tolerate it and get through it, just like how you knew you absolutely yes. would tolerate and get through having COVID. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's so when, when a metaphobe say that, that's their perfectionism and their desire for control. Their desire for control, because they believe it's so terrible, they believe they couldn't tolerate any part of it, which is why they have to believe they've got to be to the point where it'll either never happen, like being mugged, or they know that it, 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 there'll be no, nothing unpleasant about it. And, of course, that's massively unrealistic because it is unpleasant for 10 minutes yep. or an hour or two hours. or whatever. It is unpleasant. Nobody likes it. Yep. Okay? But it's only that desire for control that pushes them to get to that point. So in, in, in almost all the literature around exposure, it's very, very poor. Success rate is low. And when I say low, so even David Veal at the at the, the NHS super clinic in the UK for the treatment of metaphobia, possibly the on, on a governmental level, the world leading expert in emetophobia, tells his patients, you cannot overcome emetophobia. You will not overcome emetophobia. You cannot overcome the phobia. It's impossible to overcome. What I will do is teach you how to live with it better which you and I know is just not true. I mean, you specifically know because you used to have it really badly and I don't have it at all, okay? So we know that's not true. So you're also then, the people that recommend it are the people that probably have never had it, as in the people that recommend exposure therapy are probably people that have never had emetophobia or they're yep. professionals that don't fully understand it. So yep. you're being recommended it by someone that really doesn't know what they're saying. Or potentially someone that has, you know, overcome a fear of spiders by, you know, being in the same room as a spider. And yes. relate and relating that to emetophobia. Yeah. 
Okay. So, I mean, exposure therapy on the whole, well, you know, the nature of exposure therapy, facing up to the thing, living through an experience or experiences of the thing that you're currently fearful of, the notion that that, generally speaking, changes your thinking to the point you get over it is absolutely true. And if you think about it, that's how you get over anything in life. I've used the metaphor before that every pilot is anxious when they have their first solo flight, okay? But very few of them run away from it. Very, I, I've never heard a story of a, of, of a pilot saying, do you know what, forget about it, I don't want to do it. I'm never going to do that. I'll give up, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give away the, the remaining £5,000 worth of lessons I've got. I don't want to. No one's ever done that, okay? Because the idea is you build up the courage and skill set to the point where it's still you're still anxious on that first solo flight, but you know you can get through it, just like I knew I'd get through COVID. You you want to do the couch to 5K, it's painful, but you know you'll get through it. You want to have a dry January, which by the sounds of it, you need a dry January, like I do. Um, yeah. It's going to be difficult, right? But you know you can get through it and you tolerate it. So exposure therapy right. generally works for things like spiders and and all the fear of flying programs like the virgin one in london are all about exposure and building your confidence mm -hmm. in your skill set but people with a fear of flying a fear of spiders fear of heights fear of snakes fear of water fear of cancer fear of all of these things are not the same as emetophobes emetophobes have uh, uh, um generally speaking much more significant or much more significant and helpful thinking styles and many many more beliefs around their their thing that they fear which are making it much harder for them to make changes they also have things like disgust propensity they also have a really strong desire for control that very very few other people have one of the quotes yep. i was looking up at this morning um was actually from david veal the guy i mentioned a minute ago and he was saying that most clinicians find it really hard to treat emetophobia because they don't understand it, but also the dropout rate is, is very, very high for people that start yep. a therapeutic program, particularly with the NHS, and then drop out. And the reason for that is their thinking styles and their beliefs, but particularly their desire for control is so strong, they won't let go of the reins. They don't want to let go of the right. reins. You know, my 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 uh, metaphor of being on par with being mugged is actually a good one because being mugged, I imagine, is a terrifying thing. And if I said to you, it's great, Joe, all you've got to do to get over your fear of being mugged is to walk around the, the dodgiest part of the nearest big city for the next three nights until you get mugged and you'll get over it. I'm sure you'd go, do you know what? I just don't want to do that. I don't <laughs> want to put myself through that Shock. What, yeah. what happens mm -hmm. if it's not a little bit of mugging and and i get injured you know what happens if i die yeah. what, you know that, and that's a reasonable response for you to make and metaphobes think in the same way so saying to them i'll just go into the room with the spider and pick it up you'll be fine you'll get over it it is an inaccurate way of talking to metaphobes they do not think that way now the other thing yeah. you got to yeah. think about is in the UK, this UK statistics, our our NHS, our psychological services on the NHS, which are, are which are, are pretty good, um, their their goal for any any um, CBT therapist, and it's usually CBT alongside exposure therapy that you're offered, right? So CBT yeah. on the NHS, the goal of a CBT therapist on the NHS is to help 50% of the people that are referred to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when I say help, I don't mean cure. I mean, move them forward a few spaces on a, on a, how bad your symptoms are chart. Okay. So first yeah. of all, their own, their goal, they're not aiming to, their goal is to help only one in two people. And of those yep. one in two people that they help, they're not trying to cure them. They're trying to get them a little bit better or usually yep. to live with your symptom a little bit more. The concept of being able to completely overcome your phobia or your symptom or your problem isn't even there. 
So you're going to see someone who is already really disempowered, believes it's going to be really difficult to help you, believes they're only going to be able to help at maximum one in two people that come through their door. And my goal then, Joe, imagine if I'd have said to you when you first came to Thrive that our goal is to help you, but not your brother, okay? And what we're going to do, we're not going to cure you. We're going to give you a few skills that will make your life a little bit easier. That's not the same thing. So we are coming from a completely, completely different perspective, okay? Yeah. Now, the other thing is, I said there were two things. The other point to this is, if your phobia were genuinely about being sick, then exposure therapy might help. You know, yeah. if you're... But as if we you're, know... Yeah, yeah, and we know that it's not, right? But if, if you're frightened as a little boy of joining Cub Scouts or joining the swimming club, right? And that's a very specific thing. Your mum or dad could cajole you or support you in going for the first couple of weeks until you get in there and you make some friends, you get used to the water or you get, get used to standing to attention with the arcane and that kind of stuff, right? and you get over it. And that works. That's, that's life, yeah. isn't it? That's how you yep. fly the plane. That's how you drive the car. That's how you ask someone out on a date. That's how you ask for a job. That's all of those things. Right? That's how you get over things. Emetophobia isn't about being sick. It never was about being sick. I've never met an emetophobe where their phobia were actually about being sick. Their phobia is about being emotionally out of control and terrified and incredibly anxious. That is their phobia. That is what they're afraid of. Now, there is loads of literature uh, backing that up. For example, uh, um, something like 18% of emetophobes don't remember the last time they were sick, right? Yep. And something like 14 or 15% of emetophobes have never even been sick. So how could it possibly be about being sick? Also, yeah. you would think if it was about being sick and, the, and the, the, the horrible feelings associated with being sick, then people going through chemotherapy, for example, where one of the side effects is, is sickness, you'd be more likely to develop a fear of being sick or emetophobia after going through the chemo, when in fact you're less likely to develop it after yeah. going through chemo. People do not develop a metaphobia after an episode of being sick. Now, before yep. angry mum writes in and says, well, my daughter never had it till she had a vomiting bug, your daughter, Mrs. Smith, already had the unhelpful thinking styles and the beliefs in place. Okay. And if you're still disagreeing with the topic of the conversation whilst you're listening in, we do have an entire podcast dedicated to this exact subject, which was, I think, last episode or maybe the episode before that, which you are more than welcome to sit down and enjoy listening to us talk away for even longer. Okay. So my, my the metaphor I made up about being mugged, Joe, is actually a really, really good example It'd be really unfair, unhealthy, unkind, mean, um, and potentially very, very damaging for you to say you need to go and expose yourself to being mugged to get over your fear of being mugged, okay? It would be much, much kinder and more successful and fairer and more human to say to you, okay, well, let's, let's build up your confidence Let's give you a skill set. Let's find out. Let's find out what's behind this fear of being mugged, and maybe give you some uh, skills to feel better about it and be more confident in talking to people, being more confident in avoiding um, stressful situations, being more confident uh, around aggressive people. You know, that be much nicer, more human mm -hmm. thing to do rather than putting you straight to the lion's den to get you to overcome your fear of lions. Yeah. Yeah especially if your phobia had actually nothing to do with being mugged, but was actually about your lack of confidence in talking to people or something. Okay. Yeah. Much yeah. better, yeah. safer, kinder human to work on the actual things that are causing the issue rather than, you know, throwing you to the lions and hoping that it works. Now, if exposure therapy worked and it worked every time and it was that predictable, this will happen if you do this, then actually yeah. the, 
then actually there might be some argument to do it. You know, if you get, I think the research that I looked at last was, here we go, let me tell you this. It was, uh, here we go, a 2001 study, Lipsig, Fire and Pataniti, said that only six out of 56 people would even attempt exposure therapy. Six out of 56, that's one in 10, yeah? And even then, only then if it was guaranteed successful. So even yeah, if but... it's guaranteed, even if I would guarantee you, even if I'd bet you 10 million pounds, here's 10 million pounds, Joe, that you will overcome mm -hmm. your fear of being mugged if you go out and get yourself mugged, only six out of 56 people would still do it because it's so frightening and anxious. Yeah. Yeah? But if you were guaranteed, even if you would definitely get over it by doing it, there would be an argument to do it that way, okay? But there isn't. I personally, personally, I have never met or heard or spoken or emailed anybody who ever completely overcame emetophobia by going through exposure. I've never met or heard from them. I'd love to hear from a listener, you know, if they want to email us, and, and they did. Definitely. And they're happy to talk yeah, to us absolutely. about it. We'll get them on and we'll talk to them about it and we'll see, we'll compare. If, if, if such a person exists and they get in touch with us, it'd be lovely to hear from mm. them. I mean, those people must exist, right? Okay, there must be somebody out there let's yep. get them on and let's talk about how much their life has changed by overcoming emetophobia by doing exposure compared to how say your life has changed of going to mm. the thrive program because that's the other argument yep. isn't it we are treating yes. the whole person yep okay we we on we, you know if someone's got a metaphobia they've got a metaphobia because of their beliefs their thinking styles their attitudes their behaviors their safety seeking behaviors and all that kind of stuff by taking away their phobia it doesn't take away all those things they've still got a strong yeah, desire yeah. for control they've still got probably low self-esteem they've probably still got high social anxiety they've still got disgust propensity the comorbidity of emetophobia with other psychological symptoms is high Lots of emetophobes have yep. OCD. Lots of emetophobes have anxiety. Lots of emetophobes yep. get depressed. Lots of emetophobes have anorexia. Okay, So curing them of their emetophobia through exposure therapy, if it were possible, still not going to mm -hmm. show those symptoms. No. Okay? So so I think it, I absolutely believe it's actually, excuse me, unethical to make someone go and get mugged in order to try and attempt to get over their fear of being mugged. Um, and, and I think if it works for one in a hundred people, then those other 99 people are going to be worse off. They're, they're not going to be neutral, are they? It's it's not that it's not going to affect them. You're not going to go out and get mugged and say, do you know what? I got mugged, Rob. Didn't get me over my fear, but you know, at least I'm exactly where I was. No, you're not. You've just been mugged. Yeah. 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 You've yeah. got a sore head yeah. and you're a hundred pounds less and they stole your Rolex. Yeah, it's not yeah, something exactly. you can do yeah. and have zero uh, effect from it. So, as we're not advocating exposure therapy, but very much what we are and part of what we do is, and what we suggest is you do have to put yourself slightly outside of your comfort zone, absolutely, right? Yes along with all of the other skills in which you are going to be learning in order to make that a much more of a tolerable experience. What is the difference then between exposure and going outside of your comfort zone? Okay. When you talk about going outside your comfort zone, you're talking about gently and slowly challenging safety seeking behaviors. Yeah, step okay. by step by step, right? I'm not asking you to dive in at the deep end, right? Or yeah. as another metaphobe, you know, hop in a taxi at 4 a.m. full of paralytic nightclubbers, right? That's not, you know, that's the deep end. We're asking you to maybe drop your mints or your ginger or your anti-nausea tablet for the morning or something like that, right? Yeah. That's like or, the starting point. Or today, wash your hands for two minutes, you know, an hour yeah. rather than five yeah. and experience the bit of anxiety you're going to have, but realize hey, you know, it wasn't that bad, nothing happened, maybe I am doing it too much. 
Yeah, tiny, yeah. tiny steps, you know, where, where you're not going to get mugged, where you're not even going to get frightened. You might create a little bit of anxiety, but we're also going to give you the skills to cope with that little bit of anxiety that you've just created in a manageable way. And we never push people to the point where they're going to create anxiety or create more anxiety. You know, it's enough. Put You push yourself enough to move forward, but not so much that you're going to, you know, take one step forward for two steps back. Yeah. yeah. And that's massively important. That way you help the 99 out of 100 rather than the one out of 100. Excuse me. Yeah, exactly. And and it's that process, it doesn't take years, right? It's not that we're saying, you know, take this baby step this week and then in a few months' time you can move on to the next one. Once that ball is rolling, you know, we, we successfully get people from being, you know, an extreme emetophobic sufferer and really living in turmoil to being completely over it within a few months. It is not a long process. And once that ball is moving, taking those next few steps along that, you know, along with all of the skills that you're learning, the momentum starts building. You start having these wins and these moments of where you're, you know, potentially doing something that you never thought you could be doing a few months ago going, oh my God. Like I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing this right now, and you feel fantastic, and you reward yourself. And those are the little steps that prove and give yourself the evidence that maybe the beliefs that you held weren't quite as true as you first thought they yeah. might be. You've got to move forward, take back control of your life in a safe and calm way. The average, the average number of weeks for someone overcoming the metaphobia at the moment with one of our coaches is just over. 7.1 weeks the average at the moment for someone overcoming just by themselves with the manual at home i think is nine weeks yeah. um you know it's just not it's not a, you know it's not a long time it's a couple it's a couple of months it's a couple of months yeah. gently moving forward gently creating a skill set and a confidence in your skill set that allows you to get a little bit stronger a little bit better every day and it's no different really than I, I'm doing this couch to 5K at the moment still. That's been two months now, right? <laughs> yeah. But every time I go out, I get a little bit faster, yep. a little bit longer. That's it. It's slow. Not enough to scare myself. Not enough to have a heart attack. Not enough to get shin splints or, or stitch or anything like that. But I'm pushing myself each time I go, and it gets a little bit easier. I get a little bit further. Sooner or later, it's inevitable I'm going to be doing that 5K. Yeah, exactly. And what would you rather do it in the gradual, steady way or be thrown out the door into a half marathon after you just you just simply don't have the skill set and the fitness and the capabilities to do that? You're going to have a horrible time. You're going to hate doing it and you're probably never going to want to do it again. No. The other thing to remember is, you know, although you know, we, we call this part of the program Metaphobia Free, Metaphobia Free is part of the Thrive Program. And the Thrive Program is about giving people helping people to have agency over their lives, to feel powerful in all areas of their lives, to feel powerful, to have a skill set in every, not just one, not just this one phobia, but in their relationships, in their work, in their confidence, in their self-esteem, in their social confidence, in their, in their goal setting, in all the beliefs they have about their skills and abilities, helping that person to feel powerful enough to live the very best life they can as well as overcoming their emetophobia. So they're doing a whole hell of a lot in two months. They're not just overcoming a phobia, they're learning to thrive. That's a massive thing. Yeah. But it does require yeah, effort yeah. every day. Absolutely. And there's there's no getting around that. But the effort is worth it if you know that it's going to change your life forever. Yeah. Because And people put the effort in because they can see themselves getting better. You know, if I suddenly if I suddenly went for my jog today and I didn't do it as quickly as I did last time, I might think, oh, well, maybe that's because it's you know so soon after New Year's. But if it happens tomorrow on the next day, I might lose my belief in the program that I'm doing. I might lose my belief in my skill set and go, oh, well, maybe I've got as far as I can and back out. So it's important, it's really important, that I keep getting better and better and better and better each and every day. Yeah. 
really important. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything on my end in relation to exposure. And I think for you guys listening in, I can't imagine there's much more to it. And I hope that that makes sense. You can always get in contact with us over here at Method Free if you have any other questions um, or you want to learn anything more about it. We'd be more than happy to help. If you've got anything else to add, Rob, then... Do you know what, I was trying to think of a good metaphor then, and the one I was having was, was, uh, wasn't was very clear. But there is a saying, isn't there? And if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I was trying to think of a good metaphor for why people would even recommend exposure therapy. It's either the only thing they know, the only thing they do, or the only thing they think will help. It's not, I promise you, it's not because they fully understand what emetophobia right. is and have come to the sensible uh, uh, psychological conclusion after looking at all the evidence that it's the best thing for this person, my son, my daughter, my friend to do. That, that's not the reason they've chosen it. Yeah. And in, in my experience, myself on a personal basis, but also within all the clients that I see that have emetophobia, is generally speaking, they have seen pretty much every specialist under the sun and they haven't got gotten significantly better so if you think about that and if those specialists are recommending things like exposure therapy then it's more like then you've got nothing to lose really in terms of you know trying out the program yourself and going down a different line and a different approach where we have all of this evidence to prove that you absolutely can overcome your metaphobia and learn to thrive as well as that in a much nicer environment than, as you put it, being yeah. marked. And, and to reiterate that other point I made again as well, you know, you and I aren't interested in in helping. Well, this is going to sound terrible. In helping individuals, of course we are. Okay, but you know, we we have a program that cures emetophobia in anybody that will thoroughly throw themselves into the program. Um, and we want to help everyone. We don't just want to help one in 10 or two in 10 or five in 10. You know, those uh, only six out of 56 people in this study would, would even would, would put themselves through exposure therapy. And that's even when they were guaranteed it would work. So it's a very, very small number of people that will do it. And a much smaller number of people that will get any benefit from it. But the people that do do it, that don't get over it, knowing what we know about their beliefs, they are they're going to be set back months, if not years. Yeah, massively. Because yeah. all you've done is shown them that they were right. It was absolutely horrible. I don't feel any better. It was the worst thing in the world. Mm. I feel terrible. I feel even more panicky. How has that helped them? That cannot be the right thing to do. Yeah, it's it's totally validated their incorrect belief about what it is actually like to be sick. Yeah. Whereas you'd be far better off getting the understanding and the realistic appraisal by building up, you know, your knowledge and your skills around your metaphobia and then gradually and incrementally pushing yourself a little bit and a little bit and a little bit outside of your comfort zone until one day that light bulb goes off, that deck of cards falls down. And, and you, you feel no power you, and you feel anymore. powerful. Don't forget, they've created the phobia because they don't feel powerful. The moment you feel powerful, the phobia goes. Which is yeah. why people like Lisa got over it in three days, although she'd been studying the program for years. Okay. The moment you feel powerful, you're over it. And I yeah. again I th I think the the mugging metaphor is a good one. You know, if you, if I send you off to get mugged in an attempt to overcome getting mugged. Even if you got mugged in a clinical setting, right? You go into a lovely hospital, and I say, wait, wait, I want to stay in that room, in this lovely, nice, safe, calm room, Joe, and at some point someone's going to come in and mug you, okay? And it's going to really help. And let's say it doesn't help. You're just going to come in and go, yeah, thanks, Rob. Brilliant. I feel great. Thank you very much. It's, 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 it's an utterly ridiculous thing to do. Final thing is... Yeah. Even having exposure therapy as a thing for emetophobia is unhelpful, right? Even if nobody ever went for it, 
the fact that it exists as an option mm. is really unhelpful, right? Because it's propagating people's belief that it's actually about being sick. Yeah. Okay, even having it as a thing, even nobody ever went for it, but saying, oh, here's one of the options, exposure therapy, it's telling people this is about being sick. Yep, yep. Yeah, which of course it isn't. So it's really, really unhelpful that it even exists apart from anything else. Yeah? And then what happens? Think about it for a minute, Joe. Think ethically for a minute. Right? Let's do, let's say it's depression instead. Okay? Significant amount of data now, significant amount of research and admission by the NHS in the last year to what people have known for a long, long time, that there's never been any evidence to link depression with brain chemistry and serotonin, okay? Yeah. Never been any evidence for that. It's what people believed, and it was a sensible belief, right? But there's no evidence for it, okay? So let's say you've got someone who's depressed, and then you, you go to your doctor, and you take some antidepressants, and your depression alleviates a little bit, which is quite likely to, okay? And then you go away. We know that people end up staying on those antidepressants for years and years and years and years and years, possibly even for life, Yep. okay? Uh, because the NHS is overworked and, and people don't have the same doctor anymore, uh, um, okay, and it's much easier to fill out a, a prescription again. So... The reality of that person's depression has never been touched upon. And it might have been something so simple. We know that the research by Jeremy Berger, for example, uh, his research says that depression is quite often created by a person feeling powerless about being able to make changes in their life. Okay? Brooding and worrying about something they feel powerless about. Okay? Which... We know in Thrive terms, it, it, that can be quite an easy thing to help someone feel better about, right? Why would you allow someone to stay on antidepressants for years and years and years when actually there is something they could do to have a, a significant change in their depressive levels just by changing uh, um, some of the beliefs and some of the attitudes and their understanding of depression? I think at some point that's going to show to be criminal, massively unethical, to help someone with with antidepressants without there's nothing wrong with antidepressants by the way i'm not i'm not saying don't use them right yeah. but antidepressants alongside some kind of psychotherapeutic treatment like thrive or something like that to help them get at the the cause of their problem is fine just giving them something that's going to cover up the symptoms for years in that's massively unhelpful massively unhelpful and and unethical and unkind yeah yeah sorry is that a bit of a downer mate no <laughs> totally agree um well you, you, I you, think... people can see and hear how passionate we are about this yeah yep. yeah how passionate you are and why you and i are doing everything we can at the moment to get to get the program in front of as many uh, sufferers as possible yeah you can and will overcome your emetophobia with a little bit of effort and it is so possible and you can just sail off into the sunset and enjoy the rest of your life without this horrible horrible phobia because it is horrible mm. and you don't need to live with it you simply don't 100 percent. okay good fantastic okay wonderful thank you for your time rob um, I hope everyone's enjoyed another episode. We will be cracking on with more as we start to go through 2023. So thank you for listening in and see you soon. And I'm doing some major updates to the program at the moment, which are going to be brilliant. And that will be ready, I would say, in about another month. So let's say the end of February 2023, a new version of the program, massively updated, easier to get through, easier explanations, it's going to it's going to make going through the program i genuinely believe 50 or 60 percent easier for people watch so this space you can all look forward to that mm -hmm.